and uh, you know um, it's great to be together. I've, I've been um, I've been doing a number of things in my quiet time, but one of the things I've been doing is working through the the, the call of the minor prophets. Mm. And uh, I'm not going to preach, but we're going to look at a passage today that's from a minor prophet, but it actually appears in the book of Acts. You know, we get through Easter, and um, you know, Easter is always um, a special time. But we're not as a church, we don't kind of stick to a sort of calendar of events through the year, do we? But you know, after Easter, of course, comes Pentecost. Mm. That's the next, well, not the, you know, the, the resurrection, mm. you know, is followed eventually by the, the events of Pentecost. And we're going to look at some of the things Peter said, or a, little, a passage <coughs> the preacher preached at Pentecost. And we're going to be talking a bit about, you know, living in the last days. Which has been on my heart. But I want you to look for, start looking at, first of all, in Matthew 28, because, you know, Matthew 28, of course, is the last time that Matthew records the disciples being with Jesus. And, um, you know, um, it's great that when we get together as a church, we have a sense of worship. Mm. Friday night was so good. Mm. When we sing together, we learn songs together, and we really lift our voices to God. And yeah. It sounded special, yeah. didn't it? Yeah. It's great to have that real sense of worshipping God. And, you know, and... Uh, it's worship something really special, you know, but I, I was thinking about that, I and mean, I was thinking about the events, you know, after the resurrection, you know, we talk, sang that today, I know that my Redeemer lives. Mm -hmm. The resurrection proved to us that our Redeemer lives. But, you know, I was thinking about the events after the resurrection, and it says in Matthew 28, verse 16, it then, says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When the, they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Now, I've read that passage. I read the next bit on all... I, I know the next bit, mm. like many of you. I know the next bit mm. quite well. I learnt it by rote. But I, I don't think about verse 17 so much. You know, first of all, it struck me as inspiring that when they saw Jesus, mm. they worshipped him. Yes. You know, that's the first thing they did. Yeah. But I didn't ever take him, but it says, but some mm. doubted. Mm. Isn't that interesting? Mm. Some doubted. You know, I want to start today by just asking, you know, mm -hmm. some, you know, we can worship or we can doubt. Mm. You know, it's inspiring that they, how could it be? They see Jesus who they knew was crucified. And yet, they see him alive, and yet some doubt it. How can we doubt? You know, I think that, uh, you know, first of all, the thing to understand is, is that we can doubt. How do we doubt? Well, we can doubt because we become somehow cynical. You know, uh, I think it's interesting that uh, often we put, in, the, in our world, we put people up on pedestals, don't we? Yeah. Have you noticed that? Yeah. You know, whether they be TV stars, sports stars, mm -hmm. pop stars, even people in businesses. I worked in a business where people were put up on pedestals. You know, what happens when you put somebody up on a pedestal? They're just bound to fall off it. Yeah. Uh, at <laughs> some point. <laughs> at yeah. some point, they will fall off that pedestal. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and uh, so I think that... But sometimes the reaction maybe to that is to think we keep putting people up on pedestals and even before they get on the pedestal now, we can start getting cynical mm -hmm. about who people yeah. are. We can say, well, I've seen this before. Right. You know, and I start think, so maybe some people look to Jesus and thought, well, you know, he looks great, he looks like the guy who died, I don't know, but maybe he didn't die really or something mm -hmm. like that. Maybe somehow he faked it, I don't know. Maybe he somehow got mm -hmm. cynical about who Jesus was. <coughs> you know, there is nothing in the last 2,000 years to, to suggest that Jesus was anything but the person mm. he claimed yeah. to be. Mm. That's inspiring. He has never, ever fallen off his pedestal, has it? Yeah. It's, and it's so inspiring that we can think about Jesus, first of all, you know, we can worship Jesus 
with the confidence that he, he is exactly who he said he right. was. Yeah. Not, not, you know, there's been attempts occasionally to discredit Jesus, but they don't work, do they? Right. They never work. They never stand up. The Bible is the only true testimony to have to his life, and who he was and what his character stood for is so strong that you, know, you and I are here today to testify to what he means to yeah. our lives. So, let, you know, we can be like the, the 11, or the, those who are amongst the 11, who worshipped Jesus. And we should read verse 18 to 20. And it says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptise them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the days of the age. You know, it's inspiring. We're going to start looking at how Peter particularly took that message truly to heart mm -hmm. and really had an incredible, incredible impact. You know, one thing about when you worship somebody is you want to please them. Is there anything wrong with wanting to please people? I had to have a little think about that myself, you know. I, I think, you know, I, I, I kind of thought about it for a while, and I came to the conclusion that um, there's, there's three types of people you're, rather going, you're, you're going to please. Well, there's two types of people you're going to please. You're going to please yourself, you're going to please other people, or you're going to please God. Those are going to be choices. It's interesting. We've got the election at the moment, haven't we? That's kind of interesting. And, you know, I was talking with some <coughs> friends about the election. And sometimes we can look at the election and we can say, well, the policies of the government, these, these people, this party are going to make, are they going to work for me? You know, as Chris Burt and my friends tell me, that some people will literally go through each party and say, add up how I will financially come out best, <laughs> depending upon which party wins the election. And that is the party I will vote for. That's one way of looking at an election. Are they going to please me? Another way you can hopefully look is you can say, well, is what's best for the country? You know, what's best for other people, basically. Then you see, if you look at the party and say, what do I think will most help? the most people. And I, I, you know, as a part of that, of this society, of this group of people, I'm going to vote for whatever. But as a Christians, you know, in our lives, we don't vote just for ourselves or even for other people. We don't, we look to please God. Mm. You know, and that's what worshipping you know, is really in many ways about, is looking at God, admiring him, and wanting to please him. Mm. You know, and uh, I think that, uh, it's funny, you know, I'm unemployed at the moment, temporarily, I hope. <laughs> but um, I am unemployed at the moment. And I kind of, you know, it's funny how you get to unemployment, you think, well, you get kind of tight on your finances and, and stuff like that. You think I'm going to save myself some money because, you know, I'm not, nothing's coming in at the moment. But one of the things you can do is you can start to think about, you know, your giving, your financial giving to the church or to the poor. And it was when I was reading the book of Joel, you know, they had a drought in the book of, of Joel caused by a a swarm of locusts mm. destroying all the crops. And interesting enough, one of the things they're most worried about is the fact that they're not going to be able to give their sacrifices. Because mm -hmm. their mindset is they want to please mm -hmm. God. Mm -hmm. And the drought has taken away their ability to please God. You know, I think, again, it's changed my heart to think, you know, our attitude towards God is to worship him, is to please him. And rather than thinking, oh, no, I haven't got anything to give, I want to think, oh, no, I want to have something right. to give. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, I hope you, we can have a sense really of wanting to worship God. But let's look at Peter. Turn to Acts chapter 2. Turn. Turn. I'll throw my glasses on the floor. <laughs> We're going to look at a bit, you know, um, we're going to look at uh, the, past, the beginning of Peter, Peter's message uh, to the, the people who were gathered on the day of Pentecost. And, um, you know, I read, I read around, a little bit around what, 
kind of commentary or something like that on this William Barclay, I think. And he, he kind of points out that um, Peter, Peter has an approach when he preaches. And you see it consistently at the beginning of Acts. Uh, there's several times when Peter is recorded as speaking. And basically, but the approach is, is he, he, systematically what he does is he makes his main point, he backs it up with scripture, and then he applies that point to ask people to change their lives. And then finally, he sort of says, think about living your whole life according to what I said. I've just given them a specific challenge. You know, and you, at the beginning of in Acts, often Peter's point is, you, <laughs> talking to the crowd, mm -hmm. you crucified <laughs> Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's what you did, sort of thing. You know, you, this person who was the very son of God, who was promised to you by the scriptures, you crucified him. And he really convicts them of their guilt. And then he challenges them to change their lives, to repent according to, uh, to what they have done. You know, he, he usually makes a sense of them doing it in ignorance. He said, you did it in their ignorance, but you did it. And now you need to repent. And he calls them. But he does prove it in the scriptures. And in this particular passage, he, um, we're going to look at, he talks, he quotes from the prophet Joel. Mm. Now, Joel, <laughs> recap, <laughs> Joel uh, prophesied, is that the right word? Yeah. Joel prophesied, talked about a swarm of locusts. And a swarm of locusts came through the land. It was a real swarm of locusts. And he, he told that the people of his time that those locusts and what they did reflected God's anger towards them in that situation. He said they symbolized an army of God coming to take away everything from you. And you need to learn, you know, you need to look at yourselves and understand what God is trying to teach you. And then he goes on to say, a real army's gonna come along and it's gonna take your land. He's perhaps talking about the Assyrians coming later to invade the, the nation of Israel. And then he finally says, but in the future, he looks towards the future into the Messianic age, he says there's gonna be a final day of the Lord that's gonna come along. But before that day comes along, the spirit is going, going to come along as well. And it's gonna have a great impact. And that's what he's, he's talking about here. So in Acts chapter two, verse 14, it says, then Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It is only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit mm. in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You know, um, there's three sort of themes that I want to talk briefly about that run through that quote that um, Peter makes from Joel. First of all, he talks about the last days. You know, I'm going to come back to that. We're going to talk about the last days. We are living in the last days. Seems hard to understand sometimes, but we are living in what he's referring to there as the last days. Then he talks about the outpouring of the Spirit. 
you know, um, spirits, I don't know, spirits an important thing, in person, to me. And it's a, it's a theme I think about a lot at the moment. You know, it, it, I think that, um, you know, at the time of when Peter was preaching right now, they in many ways saw what they did. They saw the outpouring of the Spirit. They not only had a sense of the indwelling of the spirits in their life, but they literally saw what the Spirit could do. They saw miracles that was a direct result of God's Spirit. You know, and there's three sorts of miracles, well, there's three sorts of miracles that Peter particularly talks about and is, in fact, the source of, you know. Uh, firstly, in, at, at this particular point, of course, they, these men were all talking in different, the apostles were all talking in different languages so that everybody could understand them. You know, uh, that, you know, it's funny, he says that, you know, these men are not drunk, as you might think. Interesting enough, if you look back into Joel, when the people had the plague of locusts, the first thing he accused them of all of is going and getting drunk. That's what they did. They, you know, it's not working out. It's a bad situation. Get drunk. <laughs> Forget God, get drunk. So, you know, and, but Peter sort of turns that upside down here. He's sort of saying, you know, it's not like this is a terrible situation that we're in right now. These men are not drunk. But you hear them speaking in your own languages. The first one, well, the first thing to talk about then, in a sense, we see this outward pouring of the Spirit in those multiple languages. But in a sense, we can experience that same thing in the Spirit in ourselves, in that God gives us insight to things through the Spirit. It's great to have the insight that God gives us through the Spirit when we read the Bible. You know, and I, I was, it was funny, like this week I was, um, I went out for breakfast yesterday with, with a friend. And uh, I'd seen a job advertised on Thursday in a, on, a, on the web. And um, I looked at this job and I thought maybe I can apply for this job, but I didn't really understand the job. You know, and it looked good. It said, Head of Data, London. That sounded like a good job. <laughs> and it didn't say that I was going to pay for you, but I got all excited. And I, I phoned up the agency, and uh, or I sent an email to the agency. They said, yes, you can come and see us next week, and we'll interview you to see whether we're willing to have or to put you on our book so we can recruit you for a job. But, you know, I thought, well, before I went, I'd better see if I can understand this job. And I got together with my friend David, and uh, I sat down, and he explained the job to me. He had insight into that job that I didn't have. You know, and the Spirit gives us insight into spiritual lessons, into things that we don't understand. Now, funny enough, we chatted about the job, but then we talked about his life. And it's funny, lots of things are going wrong in my friend's life at the moment. Lots of health issues, lots of issues with his wife and her job situation, all these things going on. And it was kind of weird because, you know, I, um, I said to him, I said, you know, he, he, when he talked about his troubles, I was just, you know, so keen to explain to him that God could have insight. Mm. Into, he says, I don't understand these things. They are beyond my control. I don't understand why my son's ill, why, why my wife can't hold down the job. All these things are coming at me and we have no control of them. He says, and we have nobody to talk to about them. Wow. Mm. And I said, look, you, you know, you should just talk to somebody. He said, but, you know, he said, they won't understand. And I thought as a Christian, we're so lucky not only to be able to talk to each other, but that the Spirit provides yeah. us with insight. Amen. So that we can change and understand God's will in our lives. You know, as a church, we've seen things in the last few weeks that maybe we have wondered what God is doing. The Spirit gives us insight. You know, then uh, the, another way the Spirit works in, through Peter is he heals the cripple. That's, you know, ch Acts chapter 3 or 4, you can read it, but basically he heals the cripple. And, you know, 
That's another way the Spirit really can work in our lives. He heals us mm. in ways that perhaps we can't always understand. But you know, God is there, His Spirit is there to, to give us a sense of, to take away the pain sometimes mm. when we don't understand what is happening in our lives and we face challenges and feelings that we don't understand. The third thing is back to, you know, last week we were talking about, you know, the other thing that happens to Peter is he gets put in prison. But angels come along and let him out. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, the Spirit brings freedom. And we talked last week about the dog running around in the field. You know, sometimes, you know, there's a spirit of freedom that comes through the truth. When we understand God's plan for our lives, when we understand what God is saying to us and we become obedient to it, then we have freedom. So there's three things I really think, you know, we've got to think about is that, that, that uh, when Peter talks about the outpouring of the Spirit, we may not see the outpouring of the Spirit, but we can experience that indwelling spirit in our lives and the freedom that comes through it, the healing that comes through it and the insight that God provides us. The third thing that Peter talks about there is he talks about, he talks right at the end, he says, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That phrase really rings with me. Every time I read it, I have to read it again. The reason I have to read it again is because it's funny, actually. We were talking, you know, earlier on, it's true. The Bible, the, the, the Bible says we are a chosen people. We are a chosen people. But, it, you know, and some, often we might think of ourselves as being called. But here, in this passage, it says that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. In many ways, the choice is ours. Mm -hmm. You know, I think even when we're studying the Bible or when we're just facing difficult challenges in life, we can think, is God putting up some barrier right. yeah. to stop us, to prevent us getting what we need, want, or what we think is best for us, our families? No. God says, you call on his name, you will be saved. Mm -hmm. The choice is yours. And so, you know, it's, it's a very powerful sort of message, you know, that, that, that Peter brings. But I want to focus just a little bit on the living in the, the last days. Because he says this at the beginning of that, he says, in the last days. You know, and I thought, I thought about that bit, and I... Um, it's hard to believe, well, not hard to believe, but you know, it's 2,000 years since Jesus died. I, I, I imagine when they experienced his death and resurrection, they probably didn't think the last days was necessarily going to be another 2,000 mm -hmm. yeah. years. Mm. They probably thought it was, relatively speaking, yeah round the corner. You know, they were waiting for a second coming of Jesus and, you know, bring him back soon. Yeah. And the spirit with which they could live their lives in many ways is like, we don't have to worry about so many things. All we've got to do is make sure that when Jesus comes back, we are ready mm -hmm. for his return. Because we are living in the last days. You know, uh, so how do, we, how do we respond to that 2,000 mm. years later? Uh, in William Barclay's commentary on, on Acts, well, he says something interesting. He says, you know, when it comes to waiting for the return of God, you're either going to be in the way or on the way. <laughs> I thought that was a great point. You're going to be in the way or you're going to be on the way. I know what it's like to be in the way. <laughs> Sometimes our house is full of five people, you know. <laughs> you can very easily be in the way. But being on the way is a great thing. 
You know, and uh, I thought, how, so how can we do this in the way, as opposed to being on the way? Well, I, w I went out to pray about this, and I was walking around where I lived, and uh, where I live, and I walk up past the Tesco store, and on the right-hand side, when I walk past, is a housing estate that we used to live in when 10 years ago. It's called Manor. Ask Alex, ask Zach about Manor Estate. Manor Estate has a reputation <laughs> in Alton. It's not the most, I was kind of glad to move out of Manor Estate. <laughs> we got out of Manor Estate, we moved up Marcus into Woody's. But you know, um, it was funny as I walked past and I saw Manor Estate, sure enough, Sirens, police cars <laughs> came up the road. And, and first of all, it was one and it turned into a manor estate. I said, no surprise there. <laughs> then another police car came up, sirens like that. I thought, this is typical. I'm so glad we moved out of manor estate. But you know, one of the things that used to strike, strike me was that, um, <laughs> this is going to sound wrong, but you know, uh, what was. The lives of people on Manor Estate, often there was this sense of ongoing emergency, like the sirens in their lives. Things would be going wrong. Domestic situations mm. would be getting out of control. You know, as I thought about it, you know, we may be in the last days, but we don't live, need to live our lives from one emergency to another. But we do need to live urgent lives. Yeah, yeah. And that was a subtle difference. Mm -hmm. You know, your life can be you know, full of one emergency followed by another emergency. That's why we need to have good lives. Yeah. That's why it's good for me to get a job. That's why it's good for you to get an education. That's why it's good to be wise with our money, to bring our children up well, to work hard at making our marriages strong is because we don't want our lives to jump from one emergency to another. But we do want lives that are urgent in the sense of time is short and we have to do our best for God. And I think, you know, as a young Christian, you used to have a real, maybe more of a sense sometimes of that sense of urgency. Sense of urgency sometimes for, for people around us. You know, people are not going to find God unless we are urgent to let them know the gospel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're not going to, you know, it's great communion that uh, Marlon did today, really mm -hmm. great communion, but we're not going to make our lives what they need. We're not going to be strong Christians and great examples if we are not urgent in confessing our sin and making our lives strong our relationships with God yeah. as strong as they can be. Yeah. You know, and uh, there's some great scriptures that appear in the Bible, I think about it. You know, Jesus himself said, live for today. Yeah. You know, it's great to have a spirit of living for today. Now, I thought about this a little bit. Sometimes it's good to look back as well. One of the things I have to do for myself sometimes, like this with Bible study particularly, is to think, what did I read yesterday? Mm. That's a good old test for me. Yeah. What I read yesterday, and a lot of the time, I can't even remember what I read yesterday. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. like, it seemed really important at the time. <laughs> yeah. But right now, I've forgotten it. So it's good sometimes to look back and mm. to understand and to reflect and think what God is teaching us. But it's also great to have a sense of what am I going to learn today? Mm. And what am I going to do with what I learned today? A couple of scriptures that come to mind is it's, it's really great to have that sense, Paul talks about, of making the most mm -hmm. of every opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Having an urgency in our life that says, whenever we have the chance, it's like my friend we were talking about his problems yesterday, having an urgency that we can share mm -hmm. about God when we have the chance. <laughs> mm -hmm. Another great scripture in Acts is when it talks about, it says, they preach, you know, when they were scattered, after the persecution, it says they preached the word wherever they went. Mm. That same sense of urgency, the opportunity, and just mm. a great spirit of, I'm going to make the most of everything. So we should be urgent 
but not living in an emergency. That's part of living in the last days. And, you know, another, th another thing I thought about was, another thing I thought about was working it out or working out. Now, this one is big for me. Now, if you're a, if you're a football fan at this time of season, what happens is you start to work out the mathematical possibility <laughs> that your team can win enough games either to not go down or end up in the Champions League. Yeah. If you're Arsenal, you try to work out the mathematical possibility that you can end up ahead of Chelsea. Yeah. You know, and uh, so you know, we, we try to work things out. The truth of the matter is it doesn't matter how many times you work the mathematics out, all that really matters is if you're going to win your next game. Nothing else is actually going to change it. You know, another example, my, Alex, my son, does, um, he, he does, um, he's a personal trainer. Now, to be a personal trainer, you have to give people programs. You know, and Alex spends a fair amount of time working out what working it out in terms of what people need to do so they can achieve their physical fitness goals. Mm -hmm. He works with some great people. People have um, health problems in many ways, and he works out programs for them so that they can improve their physical situation. But at the end of the day, he can work out as many programs <laughs> as he likes, <laughs> unless you actually show up and do <laughs> the program. <laughs> it makes diddly squat difference. So oh, yeah. 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 Now, in my spiritual life, I sometimes end up working out, working it out what I should do right, a lot more than I'm actually doing it. You know what I mean? I, 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 you know, I, I've worked out how to reach out to so many people in so many ways. Great ideas, but they don't always. You know, I don't always work them out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, being urgent is not just having a plan, but it's actually acting yeah. on your plan. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and uh, you know, the, it's funny. I've been um, I've been doing some Prince Two training on project management. And um, the great thing about Prince Two training is I've been doing it online. And when I finish doing my training, I can apply to do the exam. I'm approaching the position where I can do my exam soon. Ooh. I'm dreading it a little bit, so I've got to put my name down and say I'm going to show up and do my exam. I can go and do my exam and then I'll have a qualification in Prince 2. But I won't really know what that stuff means until I actually run a project mm. using the Prince 2 principles. I thought about how I've learned the guard, the gospel, scriptures. Right. You know, as a young Christian, I learned every single scripture that you needed to know to help somebody become a Christian. I can still recite many of them to you. To Acts, you know, 2 Timothy 2, 3, or what is it, 3, 16 to 17. You know, all scripture is God-breathed, useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. No good me knowing the scriptures unless I actually use them yeah. Yeah. to help someone. You can even pass the exam. We did do exams. I passed the exams. <laughs> but you know, you're not going to just be working it out. If you're going to be urgent, you're working out, you're actually doing it. Yeah. And the final thing I thought of is you've got to be, are you challenged or challenging. <laughs> Goes a bit back to my parking, parallel parking of last week. <laughs> Christian life can seem difficult. The standard can seem really high. You know, and those moments come in our life where we, um, we, uh, we fall short of our own expectations. For me, you know, those moments when I get angry or embarrassed, when I get, you know, <laughs> I took Alex to take his, I can't believe this, I took Alex to take his uh, driving test, not his, you know, his written driving test this week. We got halfway there and we ran into traffic. 
His, his exam is at 2 o'clock. He has to be there at quarter to 2. We hit traffic in Farnham. I took a route. I thought, we'll take a diversion. I know the way round. The diversion was a nightmare. We drove for five, ten minutes. Finally, there was a sign saying, it's that way to Aldershot. I, and I thought, yes, we're going to get there. The road is closed. Oh, oh, no. Demons have taken over. <laughs> the road is closed. I was so angry. And, and I'm telling you, it's not my fault, Alex. <laughs> I said, should we stop and go for a bit? <laughs> it doesn't matter that much. But you know, sometimes life can be challenged and challenged, and you can feel challenged and you sin. But you know, our lives need to not be challenged, they need to be challenging to others around us. You know, that's what's so great about what Marla was saying about walking in the light. When we walk in the light, we shine. And when we shine, those around us are inspired and convicted and our example challenges them. You know, much of what Peter did at this phase was that he convicted them so much that Jesus' life was, of Jesus was everything they had asked for. You know, Jesus came and set the perfect example, but it just made them angry. And so rather than being challenged to do the right thing, they became resentful to the point where they were willing to kill him. You know, so that, that's it, you know. We're living in the last days. You know, I hope that, that you have a sense of excitement. We understand and we see that from the beginning of time, God has had a plan. Mm -hmm. through, the re through the death and resurrection of Christ, he com completed a very important part of that plan. And we should worship him and please him with our lives. But more than that, he gave us his spirit, his spirit that can work in us, provides us with insight, it heals us in a way that maybe a, doc, you know, a doctor can heal us physically, but the spirit can heal us emotionally, physically, spiritually, and inside, mm -hmm. inside of us. And he gave us, you know, he gave us a way to be on the way instead of in the way. Mm -hmm. So we can have a sense of urgency, not living our lives as emergencies. <coughs> we can have a sense of not feeling challenged, but living challenging lives. And we can be working out our salvation with fear and trembling, not trying to work out what our salvation should be. Thank you very much. Amen. Amen.